there. I'm a nondescript female here to talk to you about Thomas Paine and common sense. I realize I'm not looking directly into the camera lens and there's a reflection coming off my glasses. But if any of those things bother you, that sounds like a personal problem. This video is coming to you in three parts. Part one, who the heck is Thomas Paine? Thomas Paine lived between February 9th, 1737 and June 8th, 1809. Thomas Paine was a political activist, theorist, revolutionary, philosopher, writer type person. He was the author of two of the most influential pamphlets during the American Revolution, one of which was Common Sense, which we'll be talking about today. So according to Paine, society is everything constructive and good that people band together to do, and government is different in that it exists solely to protect people from their own vices. According to Paine, government has its roots in the evil of man and is therefore a necessary evil at um. best. Government should exist solely when it is effective, and Thomas Paine believed that according to normal human common sense, people should be able to deconstruct their government and rebuild it if it became ineffective. And it being ineffective would imply that it was no longer good at protecting life, liberty, and property. You thought I was going to say the pursuit of happiness, but I didn't. Next in his book or pamphlet or whatever you'd like to call it, Payne considered an imagined scenario in which a small group of people had been placed on an island and cut off from the rest of society. In time, these people develop ties with one another and lawmaking becomes inevitable. Payne says that people will be much happier if they are responsible for the creation of the laws that rule them, i.e. America. Payne proceeds to then launch a general attack on the British system of government. Payne says that the British system is too complex and rife with contradictions and that the monarchy is granted far too much power. The British system pretends to offer a reasonable system of checks and balances but in fact does not. Payne argues that man was born into a state of equality and the distinction that has arisen between king and subject is unnatural and therefore shouldn't exist. Payne acknowledges the counter argument from the British that America has flourished under British rule and therefore ought to stay under the king and he affirms that such an argument fails to realize that America has evolved and no longer needs Britain's help. Some say that Britain has a protected America and therefore deserves its allegiance but Payne responds to that by saying that Britain has only watched over America in order to secure its own economic well-being. Therefore, Britain is selfish and why should we owe them anything? Payne adds that most recently, instead of watching over the colonies, the British have been attacking them. And we know as US history students that that is true. British have been sending troops over to America to patrol the colonies and keep them kind of oppressed which of course the colonists don't like and we know how the colonists get when they don't like something. It's because of this that Payne says that Britain does not deserve the loyalty of America. Payne says the colonies have little to gain from being remaining like attached to Britain. Commerce can be better conducted with the rest of Europe but only after America becomes independent. Payne even proposes the form of government that the independent colonies should adopt. His recommendation is for a representative democracy that gives roughly equal weight to each of the colonies. Um, Payne also argues that America is sufficiently small to be united right then, and if time were to elapse and the populations of the colonies to grow, the same feeling of unity wouldn't persist and it'd be harder to unite. Payne adds that if Americans revolt now, they can use the vast expanses of uncharted land to the west, hashtag western expansion for the win, in order to pay for some of the debt they will obviously incur from all the fighting with the British. That is the conclusion of part two, part three. This is common sense analysis of content. I promise I'll be brief. Common Sense was published in 1776 and it challenged the authority of the British government and the royal monarchy. The plain language that Plain used spoke to the common people of America and was the first 
book to openly ask for independence from Great Britain. Thomas Paine's use of common vernacular allowed common sense to be easily circulated amongst the colonies with a widespread popularity. It was basically the 18th century Harry Potter when you think about it. Harry Potter the series is long but it certainly isn't hard to read. The language is relatively simple and it's a big part of our culture therefore it's super popular. Common sense was easily understood by everyone. Almost everyone shared that opinion. Everyone loved that book. They were all talking about this pamphlet and it was popular for such a long time. I mean we're still talking about it today. There are some documents that just change the course of history in a way that we can't just forget about them because they made such a gigantic impact on the formation of our nation and other nations. That's it from your local nondescript female. I hope that made even a little bit of sense. Goodbye. And we all love Thomas Paine. It just, it sucks that he was a wife beater though, because otherwise he, he was the author of two of the most revolutionary um, judge people, but solely on 